within the many institutions of the Imperium of Man, endurance is as rare as it is desirable. Over its 10,000 years of existence, there are few things that can be said to have truly survived the fires of war, the schemes of political rivals, or the furnaces of the censor. And yet, upon holy terror there persists one organization that has been present from the very beginning. Its members bore witness to the tragedy of the Horus Heresy, the madness of the Age of Apostasy, and the long years of stagnation and decline. In the grim darkness of the 42nd millennium, they war across the battlefields of a galaxy torn in two, the heralds of a fabled Primarch from legend. They are the Emperor's original enforcers, his closest advisors, his bodyguards and his first gene kin. They were the messengers of his will, the keepers of his darkest secrets, the sworn guardians of his seat of power. They alone understand the Imperial truth in its original form. They alone remember terror before the days of unification, and they alone know the true purpose of the Golden Throne. Even now, they stand even above the Holy Warrior Brotherhood of the Adeptus Astartes, just as the Astartes stand above the masses of common humanity. Each one is a champion and a hero unto himself. In a cruel twist, this valor is perhaps their greatest flaw, for despite all their heroism and all their sacrifice, they have failed in their ultimate duty. They are the Brotherhood of Demigods, the Golden Legion, the Emperor's 10,000. They are known by a thousand names, but to the galaxy as a whole, they are the Adeptus Custodes. The Custodes originated in the half-remembered days of the Terran Unification Wars. Drawn from the children of Terra's nobility, even as the wars to consolidate the Emperor's rule across the planet still raged, the Custodes were bodyguards and hostages both. Taken in late infancy, each was re-sculpted through a long-forgotten process of biogenetic alchemy more grueling than even the creation of modern Primaris Astartes. The result was a warrior greater in stature, reflex, mind, and might than anything seen before. Every Custodes was a genetic work of art, closer to the Emperor's own Primarchs than to the Thunder Warriors who served as his first genetically enhanced army. Indeed, when the Thunder Warriors had served their purpose in uniting Earth, and the time came for them, as outdated and unreliable prototypes, to be quietly retired, it was the Custodes that carried out the bloody deed atop Mount Ararat. Through the long years of the Great Crusade, the Custodes filled a multitude of roles. Primarily, they were the Emperor's personal bodyguard and war host, accompanying him on campaigns and aiding in the search for his lost sons. One of their most significant deployments was to the world of Gyros Thravian. With the Emperor at their head, they saved the Primarch's Horus Lupercal, Rogal Dawn, and Mortarion from destruction at the hands of the immense Orc warboss, Garkul Blackfang. It is said that of the thousand custodians to be deployed, only three fell, at the cost of a hundred thousand Orcs. The names of these three fallen custodies were carved into the Emperor's armor, an accolade awarded not even to his own sons. It is also likely that the Custodes were present during the persecution of the two lost Primarchs and their legions, though as with anything relating to the Forgotten and the Purged, nearly all has been lost to myth and legend. In addition to their role as warriors and guardians of the Emperor, the Custodians acted as emissaries between the Emperor and his Primarchs. They were entrusted with carrying his orders, relaying information on the progress of the Great Crusade, and ensuring that his vision of a united galaxy came to pass. In a move that speaks of some limited vision of things to come, some were also assigned to keep watch over those Primarchs who had failed to meet the Emperor's standards of a rapid, secular conquest of humanity. Chief amongst them was the soon-to-be Minister of Chaos Absolute, Lorgar Aurelian. Such steps were not sufficient to prevent the Great Cataclysm of the Horus Heresy, 
and when the time came for the traitors to show their true colours, the custodies assigned to the traitor legions were isolated from their support. None would survive long enough to report back to the Emperor. Those assigned to Lorgar found themselves massacred on Istvan V, along with the Loyalist Iron Hands, Ravenguard, and Salamander's legions. The nearly 1,000 custodies sent with Lehman Rust to apprehend the traitorous Magnus the Red met a similar fate, as they found themselves cut down in droves by the psychic powers of the Thousand Sons. But the bloodiest struggle the custodies would endure during the heresy would come not from the Thousand Sons' homeworld of Prospero, nor even from the Siege of Terror itself, but from the veiled events of the war within the webway. This clandestine war was propagated when Magnus the Red broke the psychic seals surrounding the Imperial Webway project, which would have freed humanity from its reliance on the warp for interstellar travel. This campaign saw nearly the entirety of the Custodes, along with the Sisters of Silence, enter the Webway portal beneath the Golden Throne, and for five long years they battled the hordes of demons and traitor Astartes that sought to breach it. Had they failed, all of Terra would have been overrun by demonic forces, but victory cost the Custodes more than 9,000 dead, as well as the lives of its three commanding tribunes. Such losses meant that, by the time Horus himself came to Terra, the Custodes were a shadow of their former strength. Though they gave all they could to defend their liege, in the end, it was not enough. The Emperor was laid low by the dying blow of the Archtraitor, and forever interred within the Golden Throne. The Custodes turned from the wider Imperium and threw themselves into the duty they had ultimately failed, the defense of the Emperor's mortal form. They now lived beneath the shadow of the Emperor's internment. Many eschewed their armor in shame, whilst others simply abandoned the deep red cloaks of office for a black shroud of mourning. At the behest of Rabute Gilliman, one of the few remaining Loyalist Primarchs, the Custodes agreed to the Edict of Restraint and were confined to Terra and the Sol system. Though over the long millennia that followed, the Custodes were able to rebuild their strength, they were bound to never leave the Solar System. Aside from a brief, extraordinary intervention to stop the rule of the Mad Ecclesiarch Gog Van Dyer during the Age of Apostasy, the Custodes' actions would be limited to the security of the Imperial Palace and the Sol System for the next 10,000 years. The organization of the Custodes reflects their greatest strength, the individual skill and prowess of their members. Each Custodian is part of a sodality, a formation similar to a squad, but with far more tactical flexibility afforded to the individual. Several sodalities make up a shield company, commanded by a shield captain, which in turn form shield hosts. Each host is specialized around a particular duty, from the Solar Watch, which operate the Custodes fleet of warships, to the Emissaries Imperiatus, who serve as expert diplomats and negotiators, to the Shadow Keepers, who guard the ancient horrors locked within the dungeons beneath the Imperial Palace. These hosts are guided by a council of their shield captains and Vexilius Praetors, their most veteran members and the bearers of a company's Aquila standard. Though several higher ranks exist, many are monikers signifying respect rather than formal positions. Every custodian is ultimately answerable to the Captain General, an individual elected from their own ranks to be their leader and representative within the Senatorum Imperialis. There exists a further separation between the wider ranks of the Custodes and the Companions, the elite 300 who form the Emperor's personal attendants. This inner circle are directly responsible for the Emperor's safety, maintaining a constant vigil within the Sanctum Imperialis and over the Emperor himself. Each is selected from the wider ranks of the Custodes for some exemplary feat of skill and bravery that elevates them above their already superhuman brethren. Within their ranks can be found the finest minds and surest blades of the Custodes, and there has not been a single Captain General that did not first serve as a companion. In the days before his internment, it is said that the companions were the Emperor's closest confidants and trusted with whatever doubts and fears that may have plagued the master of mankind. 
In addition to their usual training regime, the Custodes conduct blood games amongst themselves. These years-long competitions see one Custodes cast out from the palace and tasked with returning undetected, infiltrating the defenses of the palace and carrying out a mock assassination of the Emperor or another high-ranking individual. These exercises ensure not only that the Custodes are masters of counter-espionage, understanding every conceivable route an enemy agent could possibly take through the palace, but are more than capable of conducting such work themselves. Whether for the gathering of information or to strike at a target before it becomes a threat, these skills are invaluable in their sacred task of protecting the Emperor. Being part of the Emperor's personal household, the Custodes continue to be trained in far more than just the art of war. Their educational repertoire, which has persisted since the heresy, includes topics as varied as the political landscape of Holy Terror to the cultural history of humanity. This is reflected both by their Captain General's inclusion amongst the High Lords, a position in which a mastery over political machinations is a matter of life and death, and in the very naming conventions the Custodes practice. This latter honorific is a key tenet of the Custodes. Upon their successful induction, a newly inaugurated member abandons any name previously given to them and instead picks one from humanity's collected myths and legends. The archives from which they can pick their name are unparalleled in the wider Imperium, with documentation dating back before even the Dark Age of Technology. Upon selection, each custodian inscribes their name on the inside of their armor, with more names awarded as great deeds are performed. It is said that Constantin Valdor, the Custodes' first Captain General, had earned over 1,932 names before his disappearance. From the earliest days of their inception, the Custodes were awarded use of the finest weapons and armor to which the Imperium had access. This tradition has continued, and at present, the Custodes Armory represents one of the mightiest collections of war gear in the known galaxy. They wield the finest suits of powered armor the Imperium can maintain and bear weapons of rare and irreplaceable design. Even their vehicles are equipped with advanced anti-gravity technology that has only recently been matched by the innovations of Belisarius Call, the legendary Martian tech priest. Even so, their capacity to conduct war is nigh unmatched. Such standards extend to their starships as well, and they operate a range of cruisers and battleships that form the core of the Sol System's defensive fleet. Amongst their number is the Emperor's own flagship, the immense Bucephalus. Beyond this, the Custodes garrison a series of five star keeps that protect the navigable routes into the Sol System. In the early 42nd millennium, the Custodes saw a limited deployment across Terra, attempting to stem the flow of madness that followed in the wake of the Great Rift. It was not enough, and when at last the cults of Ruin had completed their bloody rituals and a tide of demons poured into the streets of the grown world itself, it was a force of 4,000 Custodes alongside the Grey Knights and Imperial Fists that would stand against them at the Battle of Lion's Gate. But the servants of the Chaos God Khorne were vicious in form and endless in number. In a repeat of the war within the Webway, the Custodes and their allies were forced to pay with their lives to hold every street against the Demonic Horde. It was only with the intervention of the newly resurrected Robute Gilliman and his Primaris Marines that the costly struggle was at last put to an end. In the face of their failure to protect Terra itself from the touch of the archenemy, it became apparent that the Custodes would have to adapt in order to keep the Emperor safe. Between them, Captain General Trajan Valoris and the newly titled Imperial Regent Gilliman revised the Edict of Restraint, ensuring that while the elite companions would remain by the Emperor's side and secure terror, the rest of the Custodes would be free to crusade across the galaxy. Once more donning their red cloaks, the Custodes would go forth and be the golden spear tip of Gilliman's Indomitus Crusade, bringing the fire of the Emperor to those who had cast him down 10,000 years before. The Custodes have seen the Imperium from its earliest beginning to the present day, 
with the most venerable of its dreadnought inferred brothers still remembering the early days of the Unification Wars. They recall the Emperor as he stood, not as a god, but as a man, driven by vision and the promise of a bright future. To an Imperium long since lost in the dogma of its institutions, they alone remember its original purpose. To a galaxy ripped in two by the terrors of the warp, they remember when the freedom to leave its influence forever was within their grasp. To a galaxy beset by war and carnage, they remember when the dream of a united humanity and a peaceful future had been so close. When the Emperor first united Terra, they stood by his side. Through the long years of vigil, they have remained. When at last the days of ending come, if the Imperium is shattered and the last defenses of Terra lay in ruin, they will be there still, blades drawn and hearts steeled against the coming storm. The Templin Institute investigates the nations, factions, and organizations of alternate worlds. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to join the Templin Institute, consider pledging to our Patreon page. Along with increased security access, you'll be able to vote in polls to determine future topics, get custom wallpaper every week, and receive some other exclusive rewards.